Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We're so pleased to welcome all of you back for part two of this two-part series. For you who weren't with us last week, we did part one of a Goodwill uh, mission to South America, in fact, to Honduras. We have our same four guests from last week, and we're so pleased to have them back. And there are really four aspects to this mission. One was uh, medical service to the people, veterinary medicine to the animals was the second, and construction was third, and some introduction to soccer and sports was the fourth mission. Last week we dealt mostly with the medical aspect, and this week it will be more about the construction and also about sports and some of the living conditions, particularly the children. I welcome back to the program, first of all, is Mr. Alan Ortman. He is a pharmacist here in Idaho, and he was on the trip. Next to him is a medical doctor, Dr. Mike Dixon, who headed the medical team. And next to him is uh, Becky Damaris, who is a nurse in our community and, of course, was on the trip. And last, and very importantly, is Reverend Matt Morgan, who is the youth pastor of Lake City Community Church in Coeur d'Alene, and that is the a church that organized this particular mission. Welcome to all of you. We're happy to have you back. It was a great week last week. Uh, and to our viewers, we'll have some slides to show of this trip also. And I welcome our panel back again, uh, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who is Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College. And Janelle will ask the first question. Matt, my question is for you to begin with. Would you please acquaint our viewers with exactly what this trip was, how long it was, how many people went on this trip? Where did you go? Yeah, we went to uh, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, which is the capital of Honduras, and we took 45 people with us from our church, uh, some from the community and most from the church. Uh, we, we contacted a missionary down there, and he set us up in the community, uh, and we went down for uh, 10 days in June of last year. That's terrific. and. Uh, Alan, how about communication? Uh, could you talk to the folks? Well, <laughs> I could not. Some of the uh, people that went did know some uh, Spanish, particularly uh, some of the people on the construction and uh, uh, soccer team. Uh, most of us in the medical team knew very little to uh, know Spanish, and so we worked through interpreters. So you did have an interpreter with you? Yes. Someone who understood both English and Spanish. And Dr. Dixon, uh, you didn't spend all your time working, I don't think. Did you do some sightseeing? And if you did, tell us two impressions that you had um, of, of life in Honduras. Well, actually, we did spend most of our time working, but we had a couple days to, uh, uh, to uh, see the city and uh, some of the surrounding area. I think one of the, uh, one of the things that really impressed me was it's, it's a very busy city. Uh, the traffic is very busy, um, and, uh, and not a lot of rules. Uh, <laughs> About how you drive. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And yet there was, uh, there, there was no anger. Uh, that uh, if People would uh, literally just decide to make a U-turn in the middle of a very busy road and just back up and back up and back up until they could turn around, and everybody waited, <laughs> and nobody got upset. And, <laughs> and, uh, uh, they were honking all the time, but mostly to let each other know where they were because they'd pass on both sides. But but they uh, but they never they didn't get angry at each other, and and that was just I think one of the my one of the things I was most impressed with with uh, with the Honduran people in general is that they they're very happy uh, very happy people uh, that work well and live well together. And Becky, a question for you about the women and girls that you saw, dress and uh, fashion and that sort of thing. Well, we went with the impression um, that the women all wore dresses and those that didn't weren't thought highly of. But when you did get down there in the barrios, the older women, anybody who was probably 25 and older, they were pretty much in dresses. But there was jeans, a lot of current fashion, um, a lot of Tommy Hilfiger. It was. We were surprised at the clothes that they had. It was pretty modern. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. To, um, I want to start with Matt uh, on this round. And Matt, how did you get 45 people to be on the same page? And, and what? How did you? Um, how did? Was there any orientation that you provided for them before they went on the trip? Any kind of training? How did you? How did you? Um, 
get everybody on the same page before they left. Yeah. We had we, we introduced the trip six months in advance. So after introducing the trip, uh, people paid their deposits to sign up for the trip, and then we began to meet monthly. Every single month we'd meet, we'd pray for the trip, and then we broke it down into teams. Mike led the medical team, and, and then we had a, a leader of the veterinary team, a leader of the soccer outreach team, and then a, a leader of the construction team. And they were able to, like the soccer team, uh, they they practiced together for months in advance. They would meet every single Sunday after church. They would practice what they're going to run their drills, how they're going to run their scrimmages, and all those things. Uh, and then the, the largest thing that we did, other than our monthly meetings, is we went on a retreat for a weekend together, and uh, up to Shimon Concrete Camp. It's a it's the Union Gospel Missions Camp up in Spokane, and they gave the camp to us for the weekend to train our people. And we did a ropes course together, uh, which was really a, a challenging thing to do. Learn about each other. And then we broke up into our teams about how specifically we were going to do it. Mike trained the medical people. How are they going to do it? How are they going to triage, run people through the doctors, get their medicine, and then out? And then construction talked about how they were going to do the cement work and for people who hadn't done it before. And each team got to do that. Um, so I really relied heavily on the, the other leaders. And so I tried to train the leaders, and then the leaders trained the people, and, and we all went together. Awesome. We're going to go through a number of slides. Again, I always think the viewers, that's why we're on. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to take them on the trip by using some visuals. And Dr. Dixon, we'll start with you. Others could uh, also make comments. Uh, we have about, uh, I think, a total of something like 10 slides. And we're going to start with this view. This is an overview of the city. Is this correct? Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's taken from one of the hills. It's a very hilly city. Um, and uh, the barrios just spread on forever in and out of the valleys and uh, just tiny little tiny little houses, uh, dirt roads that look more like what we would consider alleys yeah. and it just What's sprawls. What's the population approximately? Is there? It's 1,100,000. That's a very large city. Mm -hmm. And then the next one we start back and look at some of the medical. This is uh, again you dealing with one of the patients. Yes, there's one of the little girls in the, uh, that came to the clinics. Yeah, it's really so neat. They're all beautiful people. Yeah, they are. Aren't they? They are. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're looking at some of the construction, which we want to spend some time on in the program. Yeah, this is the uh, or the, uh, a church that the construction team was helping to build, and they were actually building those uh, the concrete beams that are in the forms up there. And uh, Matt might want to comment on this, but they had to um, mix the cement bag by bag and carry it in that small mi mixer, mm -hmm. which happened to be working, fortunately, and uh, and then carry it uh, bucket by bucket and hand it up to someone up on the top and. Yeah. Pour it by what, hand. what kind of building is this they're building? This is a, a school. Um, it's, it's part of their church, but eventually they hope to be a school where it, it'll, the beams are so large because it's supposed to go up four stories. They only build what they can. So, however, we brought the money, we paid for the materials, and so now it's going to sit that way until the next group it's comes phase in. Phase one. It, well, our part of the trip was really like, you know, part 55 of phase one and yeah. there's you know like a thousand parts that that beam there um, they poured it by hand if you could imagine filling a canoe with a Dixie cup oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's about what it's like because they had to fill it with little buckets but other groups will follow you in to yeah continue. and they'll put they'll pour the floor that's and um, put a roof on and all that yeah and the next slide is of a woman I believe working in construction what is the the, the digging a ditch we've noticed in several of the slides Mm -hmm. But what is this particular construction? This, this is uh, Nina Sweet from the church, uh, from our church, and uh, she, they they were building a road up to what is now a soccer field, but is eventually going to be a big arena, mm -hmm. um, and they were building a road to get up to it so that they could uh, do more construction up there. And they wanted these ditches on the side to fill with rock, uh, so they'd have a rock wall on both sides. I saw the rock wall on the on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was narrow, and I couldn't figure out where in the world this is going to be, where they were building some sewage line or water <laughs> pipeline and that, that explains it. And now here's another picture of somewhat like last week and similar in the uh, Mike, uh, they do their washing and hang it out. Yes, this is another uh, just very typical picture in the uh, in the barrios and uh, there, there's laundry hanging everywhere. People stay very clean. And a lot of work at that though. Yes, even they don't have running water. And I couldn't power. resist yeah. choosing this one Dr. Dixon because it seemed they had this, and there's others that we don't show, but they just seemed like how many people they could pile on top of another person to carry. <laughs> is that right? This is at the retreat that uh, Pastor Matt spoke at. It, uh, uh, this was part of the ropes course. It was one of the games they had us do to, 
And that particular one, they were trying to, we had to figure out how to get our entire team across a lava field with uh, a limited number of people who could uh, actually cross I would suggest you probably should now work with your patients with back problems. <laughs> 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 the next one is part of the soccer game. Yep, it was one of the hundred uh, kids. This is, uh, he's, he's uh, juggling a ball. We, we brought 250 of those soccer balls down. We purchased them here. Wonderful. And uh, brought them down and every, every kid, we, we had 200 kids come, so, but we needed 50 extras to uh, cause a diversion while we give these balls away. Um, but uh, we, we gave them each a ball in a, in a jersey, a brand new jersey Wonderful. with a number on it. And so it was kind of cool to see him juggling that. And we have another shot of the soccer, I believe. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. And I, is, I, of course, uh, soccer is very big in different parts of the world. I assume that they really took to this immediately. Oh, they're, they were better than our kids, really. They, they're soccer, they're born with a soccer ball there. That's it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. But you were, they know the, how the process, but you were providing them equipment. Absolutely. This is a neat pi a la a picture of a lady in, uh, in Honduras. This is a lady that uh, came to the clinics. Yes. Mm. And we're Very gracious end, lady. And we'll end up, this is like, we're pretending this is the end of the trip. Anyway, this is a gathering of, your, of some of your people. Yeah, this is actually, it is the end of the trip. It's the last day of soccer camp. And uh, there, the, it rained so hard that the mud was so thick on the field. That's why everyone's all dirty. They went inside here and they played indoor soccer for the day. Well, uh, if I go back to the panel, uh, it's my understanding on the show last week that you indicated that they were really eager to have their photographs taken they might get on television so when you communicate with them you can tell them they've been aired in seven states in the northwest and into Canada so uh, I know Becky you're in touch with some of them and tell yes. them they did make it to TV. I will they'll be happy about that. <laughs> Janelle Burke. Matt I want to ask you a little bit about the soccer why soccer why not football why not basketball uh, why soccer and who went with you to yeah. deal with the soccer? That's the sport they play. That's the national sport there. Um, if if soccer's on, we we were one. They were in a uh, a tournament, uh, one of the international tournaments, and the Hondurans were playing one night. And we were at the mall eating dinner, and it was like the Super Bowl was going on because the people were just in an uproar uh, in there. That's what they love. That's what they play. And our goal was to reach people for Jesus Christ to be able to share the love of Christ with them. And we did that by um, bringing to them what they love and uh, sharing with them just in a tangible way how God cares about them because you know we would care enough to do their sport even though our sport would be maybe football. Uh, Rebecca Klein is a high school student, um, well she graduated from Lake City High School uh, last year and she led the soccer outreach. Um, she led adults and teenagers in, in these, this trip, it was really cool. Good, and, and Mike, what about the aging process? Did you see people as they were aging in Honduras, and is it similar to what happens here? Uh, that's really a good question, because we, we noticed that uh, the uh, people under 20 were, uh, looked very young, and you know, all just very beautiful people. And, but uh, by the time they reached 30, they looked 40, and by the time they were 40, they looked 60. And uh, we actually saw one, uh, one, my partner, Neil Nemec, saw one person, the one lady who was 100. Really? And, uh, and a few there in their 80s, but, uh, but not a lot of them get that far. Among the people who were, you, that you were seeing, were there any who were living in what we would call assisted living situations, or do people generally stay with their families? They stay with their families, and the, the older people take care of the kids. Thank you. All right, Reinhardt. I want to start with Becky. Um, I want each of you to tell us, share with us and our viewers, either an individual that you really came away with that inspired you or touched you in a special way or, or your favorite memory from this trip. Well, as I indicated in the earlier show, my daughter and I went with me and um, the human connection there is so strong. The people are so happy to have you there. It was hard to, to pinpoint one individual we did make friends with several people that we stay in touch with. Um, of course, we all got very close to our interpreters because we worked with them side by side, the medical group did, for six days. And so we did have a special bond there. But the people are so open and loving. It's, it was hard to choose one. Okay. Mike, how about you? I would agree with what she said. It was difficult to choose one. There were... Um, 
they really are special people. And certainly there was the young boy that uh, Becky mentioned last week, a uh, young boy with, uh, that was uh, paralyzed, that was a uh, young girl carried all day, because she had to wait all day in line, and then uh, carried him all the way through our clinic, all the way through the triage and to see us and in the pharmacy. And um, she just, uh, she just took care of him. She loved him, and and um, he couldn't respond in any way uh, or give back in any way. But she she was probably twelve and just took care of him. And, uh, but there there was there was so much of that uh, the people taking care of their own. Uh, it was hard to uh, it's hard to to pick one. But uh, I, I, and we all got very close to them. I. Uh, when we were doing these clinics, we just sort of set up next to each other with chairs in front of him, and uh, the two other two physicians that were uh, uh, with us uh, were often on both uh, the other, both sides of my, me. And Dr. Brett Dirks was with us, and uh, and there was one time I I, I looked over and uh, he was seeing a, uh, an elderly man with infections all over his feet, and he was trying to tell him you need to wear white cotton socks and things, and he said I, I don't have any. So Brett took off his socks and gave them to him. And I looked the other way, and Dr. Nemec was handing, was, had his wallet out and was giving uh, money to a lady who couldn't afford medicines. And you just, you just, you just, uh, you just get so close, and you, and you just really feel for them. Wow. Alan? Uh, a couple of things that uh, touched me. One was the uh, first day there was an uh, older lady that came to the uh, clinic, and she was so touched by... Uh, the medication that she received that I don't even remember what it was, but she started to weep and just, you know, thank you, thank you, you know, and um, it was just real moving. The other thing that uh, ministered to me was that uh, the second uh, church that we set up in, the uh, church had provided a couple of uh, teenage girls that uh, didn't speak any English but uh, could read the Spanish labels that I had uh, pre-printed for the medications and so could um, you know, read the directions to the to the patients because some of the patients couldn't read uh, Spanish either, and uh, just being able to spend a couple of days with those two girls, they were just so bubbly and so sweet. It was just really made an impression on me. That's excellent, Matt. Uh, we after the soccer outreach, we spent three days with the soccer outreach, and then the kids were trained to go out in the barrios and and do an outreach and. My wife and I went with the teenagers to, to do that. They had a few adults with them, but my wife and I went and we were taking, my wife took pictures. And there were two little girls at one of the outreaches that were sisters, and, and we have three girls ourselves. So they were about our girl's age, and uh, they were malnutrition, um, and so they were smaller, but their, their feet, they, they had no shoes on. And their, their little feet were just so dirty, and um, I think that's what really kind of rocked my wife and I, you know, it, it we both just kind of had a moment and uh, just, you know, really realized there's nobody there watching them. They were probably, you know, five and eight years old, no parents, and um, they were just in the middle of the street watching our outreach. And so we took a lot of video of them, pictures, and a picture of their feet, and we keep that picture of their feet um, just to remind us, you know, how lucky we are that uh, we don't have to think about it too much that we can just go get our girls shoes when they need shoes and uh, they have they have their mom and dad with them all the time you know we always watch them so mm -hmm. it, that really rocked me I just have to say that Ernest's question is absolutely outstanding and uh, we've been doing this program for 33 years and I can recall uh, I've sat here every show for 33 years and ever so often on this program it happens a couple of times a year there's a moment when it is very powerful and special in that way and I just have to say to you that you're very special and it's, uh, it's humanity at its greatest. And so my first question to Matt is that with the power of this kind of service, and you indicated early on the show that the construction is in, in a phase, uh, is there any advice you can give or indicate that those, and it can't be always you, but can we organize more in this country so there's a delegation going on on a regular basis to, to enhance that kind of progress? and keep going back to some of the same places to make that kind of yeah. success, in, like in the construction. Absolutely. Um, this, this in particular could go back for you know, many, 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 many trips. We, we, uh, I think we raised $8,000 in cash along with our you know, trip expenses to go 
for what, how much we put into it. And uh, if you've ever been to a third world country, you'll see all the rebar that sticks out of the buildings. It's because they just fold it over um, when they run out of money and then they put a roof on it until they can go up higher. Yeah. So like this trip here, uh, I could easily get you in contact with a missionary there if, you, if somebody wanted to organize a trip and go do construction there. Um, it'd be no problem. They well, at this point, then we will also once again let you give uh, the website. That's a way to get in touch. Yeah. And you can give information to other groups that might want to go. And sure. And would sure. you do that, please? Yeah, it's Lake City, just like it sounds, Lake City, CC. Dot org. It's all one word, Lake City CC, run together. Dot org at www.lakecitycc.org. And that stands for Lake City Community Church. Dot yeah. org. But, uh -huh. uh, you have to get exactly right or you won't get through it. Yes. Uh, so I think that's really neat that if we, we're a huge country with lots of people, and so there could be more of these kind of missions. By, and they can be by groups, whether they belong to a particular religion or not, or even associated with an organized religion. As you said last week, that you're very inclusive, and, and there are many others in this country too that are. Yeah. This is all service. Uh, my other question to you is, um, last week you talked a little bit about uh, it's a two-way street, the benefits you get and serving others. As I said, you're a very large church. I believe you have three or 4,000 members. About 1,600, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. I was yeah. wrong in that. Yeah. Uh, and I think that some of the other churches, I think, are maybe that large. Yeah. But you do this service here at home, and you do it abroad, and then you come back. And, and by now, I assume that you've had a lot of different people within your congregation that have served either here or other places. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe you can do that without having a great change within your population of your yeah. church. It, there's some kind of growth that comes out of that. So. My first question is, how's it changed your people? Yeah, that's huge. Um, you know, our, our, our dream as a church is that we would be a place that if, if our church no longer existed, that, that our community and our world, they would miss us. That they would, it, it, we wouldn't just be a church that meets, but we're a church that impacts the world. So we, we say to our people, um, let's go out and, and meet this world. And, what you said about humanity at its best, you were right on because God created us to serve. It's, it's one of our purposes that God created us for. And when we do that, we're, we're doing what we're made for. And you feel that reward inside of you. You feel, you feel actually literally God reaching out through you. And that's why you feel so good when you do something for somebody because it, you're no more like God than when you give. Uh, follow up would be that uh, from a theological basis, and I've always been interested in theology and philosophy in, in, in different areas, but uh, if you go back from a theological basis uh, in, in different religions of the world, I don't want to confine this to one, uh, where you talk about Christianity or, or Judaism or uh, Buddhism or whatever it may be, uh, if you go back historically, the, one of the very strong elements in that process is service, isn't it? Yeah. And, and what you impress me with, and then I'll let you react to it, is that even though it's it's nice to have a center, and that without that and without the walls and without the service you do, then these things wouldn't happen. But I I, I want you to comment further on the fact that the, if that building did not exist or was to disappear, the work goes on because of how your different uh, congregation members are are committed to this process. Yeah, that's what I would hope. You know, that's the goal that we would we would realize. Okay, we we don't have to go to Honduras to help somebody. Um, there's people right here in Coeur d'Alene. There's, there's homeless people here. Um, and we can help them right here. We can do things now. One final question before going back to Janelle, and that is the youth with, that's in this movement. And you sent your daughter and all. And Becky may want to respond to this too, but we are really spoiled in this country. As you said, yeah. we have so much. But the youth in particular that haven't lived as long may not uh, appreciate that as much as other people. But your youth that go on this, uh, I would imagine that they come home with a different appreciation of what they have. Oh yeah, the, the kids, uh, we, we actually have them reflect. We took uh, between 15 and 18 teenagers and uh, they, they, what they said um, when they came back was, I thought that those kids would be miserable. Like I would look at them and they would be um, really kind of bummed out and depressed and what they couldn't believe was how happy they were. I mean, they even seemed happier and willing to even give to them. And, and they just, here they have everything and can do whatever they want. They have opportunity. And they were so struck by how loving and how caring they, they were and how happy they were. And Becky, I'll let you talk about your, I'm sure your daughter was mm -hmm. affected too. Yeah, and 
She's 13, so that is a very selfish age. And <laughs> so sometimes she forgets, but I know as she gets older too that that's really going to affect her. But we talk about it quite a bit. And um, actually on the way home, I said, you know, I was talking to her. I said, talk, tell me about how you feel about this trip and some of the things. And she finally just looked at me, and it makes me teary. She says, Mom, I can't talk about it. She says, it makes me want to cry to think, mm -hmm. and they're so happy. Mm -hmm. And so it really did. Oh, I can't cheer you. <laughs> but it really did affect her no, that quite is a bit. Special. I yeah. mean, it, that's good because it shows how it's touched all of you. Uh, and that's, that's perfectly appropriate what you did. Um, Janelle Burke. <laughs> my, my question is to follow up on that, mm -hmm. too. I know she spent some time with young people there or mm -hmm. fa with families there. What kind of education did the children who were similar in age to her have? Well, their education system is a little bit different. Um, the one girl that she was very close to is going to school to be a dentist, and she was 25. Her fiancé was 23 and in college to be an engineer. And another boy that she got real close to, it was kind of hard to determine where he was, but he, they were trying to say he was equivalent to a sophomore in high school, but he was 19. And these were the people that were interpreting for us and volunteering and helping. And also when we were there, they were having a major teacher strike. They had 40,000 teachers striking in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And so the kids, and that was a hardship in the barrios because the kids would go to school. They would get at least one or two meals a day, and school was closed because of the strike. So comparing the barrios to the people that were helping us, it was quite a contrast. And uh, with regard to uh, literacy, did you find, Alan, uh, that some of the people as you mentioned earlier, perhaps could not read? Yes, that's uh, what we determined. I don't know what uh, percentage, but uh, I think it seemed that more of the uh, younger population seems to be more um, literate than some of the older people that uh, probably have never had any opportunity to go to school. And On that note, that to bring our permanent conclusion, the clock is one again. Okay. <laughs> On behalf of our panel and our staff, we deeply thank all of you for this two-week series. It's, in our view, it's been very powerful. And, and again, we congratulate you, we commend you. Uh, and I will end with what I said to the Reverend a minute ago, Reverend Morgan, and that is um, this is the most humane kind of service that you could have. And um, I think you've also uh, shared with our viewers who may want to also join in some way, either serving here or abroad. It's, and I also refer to the Carter Center again and the kind of service they're doing around the world. It's, it's really impacting. Again, thank you very much and, and good luck on your future work. Ladies and gentlemen, we know you've enjoyed these two programs and we invite you to be with us again next week at the same time we'll discuss another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. but I, I would call the ladies on this. And she Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. an interesting guy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He you remember one of the clothes that he would wear? He <laughs> wore cowboy clothes and... Mm. Oh. I can't remember that. I don't think I ever saw him really dressed up in a suit. Me. Did you? I don't think so. Well, when I get home, I can. <laughs> Well, he came and picked him up our place.
after my husband went to work at the brickyard, <laughs> and he'd drink coffee there, and his little old car was parked out in front. I wonder what people thought. <laughs> there was nothing going on. <laughs> yeah. And he started caught talking while well, there's no stopping him. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you think a lot of his personality comes out in his paintings? 